only about an hour from the tradition and culture of Kyoto is Osaka. Osaka is a city that's big and bold and larger than life and the food kind of mirrors the people here. This is a real city of the people. This time, I get amongst Japan's finest cheap eats. I have to say, takoyaki is one of my favourites. I hang out with a sumo legend. He's even got a couple of his own creations on the menu here, so I've got to try them. I get a taste of baseball, Japan style. Beer on tap, delivered to your seat, while you're watching the game, that is just spot on. And I experience perfect soba, the way it should be eaten. you got to do it the right way, so I'm sorry, Mum. Since the very beginning, Osaka's been a place where money talks. In feudal times, while the samurai of Tokyo would go up and down stairs on the left, they say to give them more room to draw their swords, the merchants of Osaka always stuck to the right to keep their wallets safe from pickpockets. Even today, the greeting in the Osakan dialect, Mokarimaka, literally translates to, are you making lots of money? And today, that Osakan trait of watching the pennies means that this is the place to come for eating on the cheap. By now you could be forgiven for thinking that everything in Japan is just fine dining at the top end of town. But there's also this concept of BQ gourmet or B-grade gourmet. Cheap, casual eats that just taste good. But it's not necessarily low class. There's just as much care taken with these B-grade foods as with the A-grade. This is Dotonbori, a magnet for tourists. And in many countries that might mean a pretty average food experience but not here. The variety of Osaka's B-grade gourmet is brilliant. So let's start our cook's tour with the ever-popular takoyaki, octopus balls. I just love the speed and the pace of it. You can work up an appetite just by watching it being cooked. Lovely springy octopus in the middle. Soft kind of batter around it. Still a bit mushy. And then crispy on the outside with that really sweet, salty otofuku sauce. In here is one of the Osaka delicacies. Kushikatsu. This is what it's all about. Selection of skewers, all in a really light, crispy breading. This is pork, quail's eggs, ringy mushrooms, meatballs, even a crab claw in there. And they all go into this thick and sweet, salty sauce. As the sign says, no double dipping. There are more great dishes on Osaka's fast food menu. But for now, I'm done. Well, Almost done. It's a terrible affliction never being able to pass up a dumpling. And the Japanese answer is, of course, a gyoza. Dipped in some vinegar, soy sauce, and some chili oil. Not bad at all. The surprises this city offers the food lover don't just end at the snacks. There's a quality of craftsmanship here that chefs and cooks come from all the world over just to get their hands on. I'm here to pick up something I've had on order for a while and I'm particularly excited because this is Sakai City and that's the home of Japanese knife making. This is Mizuno Tamrenjo, where the master bladesmiths of the Mizuno family have been making swords and knives for 150 years. They make knives for every style of cooking, from heavy cleavers for splitting bone through to flexible blades for puffer fish. And the prices vary enormously. But there's one knife I really want to show you. It's a bit special. It's on the bash in my heart. This is the most expensive knife in the shop. And it's a sashimi bocho, specifically for sashimi. 
And something like this will set you back about $9,000. It's a little out of my price range. So I might just put that back before I drop it on my foot. And this one, the Gyuto, has been made especially for me. Japan's most famous blade is, of course, the katana, the legendary weapon carried by samurai. The techniques for forging katana are still practiced when making kitchen knives. The repeated heating, beating and cooling of the steel creates a strong, durable blade that stays sharp. While we're here in Osaka, I thought I'd make one of my absolute favourite people's foods. So I'm making pork and shiso gyoza. Starting, of course, with the gyoza skin. I make the skins by mixing plain flour with hot water. The hot water activates the gluten, making the dough stronger. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. That dough is really nice and smooth now, so I'll just let that sit and relax for about half an hour. While our dough's resting, I've got here the ingredients for the filling of our gyoza. We'll start with the Chinese cabbage, and that needs to be finely shredded. So of course, I'm going to use this beautiful new knife that I have. To reduce its moisture content, the shredded cabbage is mixed with salt. And while that rests, I finally chop a bunch of spring onions. And in with the spring onions, some really fatty pork mince. And the fat's really important because that's what's going to give us a nice, soft and juicy texture to our filling. Just a few seasonings in that. Some soy sauce, sake, and mirin, the old favourites. Then some grated ginger as well. Our last ingredient into our pork and shiso gyoza. Shiso. These are a herb that have a really peppery, minty flavour. I'll just put those shredded shiso leaves straight in to our dumpling filling. I always use a saucepan when I'm making dumpling fillings because it really does work well. The high sides keep the filling in the bowl. The handle's good to keep it steady. Our cabbage is looking good now. I'll just extract the last little bits of that moisture. can go straight in to our pork mince. And the salt that's included in with all of that cabbage mix is going to make a real difference to the texture of our filling. Time now to prepare our skins. Simply cut into small cylinders, squash them flat and then roll into discs. And the important part for a Japanese gyoza as opposed to a Chinese jiaoza is that the skin needs to be really thin so it can get nice and crispy. These are big jumbo gyoza, so we can afford to put a bit of extra filling in. But even though they're big, we're only using about a teaspoon to two teaspoons of filling per dumpling. And then just pinch one end, and with a series of pleats, move along the entire length of the dumpling. And that's your gyoza. Now they've just started to brown, pour in some water. Pull it about a centimetre up the side of the gyoza and then put the lid straight on. Turn the heat down just a touch and let that steam with the lid on for about 10 minutes or so. And now I just finish off the gyoza with a mixture of corn flour and water and add a little sesame oil. Just fold these out upside down, nice and crispy on the bottom. Normally you'd just serve these with a dipping sauce of some rice vinegar, soy sauce and chilli oil. But because we're in Osaka, I'm going to do something slightly different. This is Okonomiyaki style gyoza. And that begins with Otofuku sauce and Japanese mayonnaise. A really good amount of spring onions. And finish off with our bonito flakes. There it is. Okonomiyaki style jumbo pork and shiso gyoza. Sumo wrestling is in more ways than one, the big time. Wrestlers go head to head in exhilarating battles of technique, speed and raw power. 
every one of the six annual tournaments held around Japan has the electric atmosphere of a Las Vegas title fight. Sumos have their own language, customs and even cuisine, and they train for most of their lives for a shot at becoming champions. Those obtaining the highest rank of Yokozuna are bona fide superstars. Kimiyasu Chiba, who fought under the name Ara Takayama, is a former wrestler who now runs Chanko Ryori Arata, a restaurant that specializes in sumo food. He was just nine when he left home to join the Fujishima stable, where he trained and learned the ways of the sumo. But at the age of 28, on the verge of reaching the top ranks, Ara Takayama was forced to retire because of a life-threatening heart condition. その時は自分では別に死んでもいいと思いましたけどね。死んでもいいからやらせてくれと思いましたけど、はい。うん、昔のね、あの、坂本龍馬っていう人がいるんですけど、その人は倒れる時もね、どこの中でも前のめりになって
Of course, there are many variations of chunko nabe that do use beef or pork, but I'm just sticking with chicken. I'm going to make some miso chicken meatballs. I've got some chicken mince here. Let's put it into the pot. Some spring onions. A touch of miso for flavour. And then salt. And a bit of water as well. When you're making meatballs or dumpling fillings, my grandma always taught me stir the mix in one direction only. I used to think that was just an old wives' tale, but there's actually some truth to it. Mixing in one direction aligns all the proteins of the meat, and that gives you a nice springy texture to your dumpling filling or your meatball. Take the meatball filling, just press it into this bamboo shape. We can put that in the fridge until we're ready to cook. So I've got some chicken thighs here as well. I'll just cut them into big chunks. Big chunks for growing boys. The ironic thing about chunko nabe is, even though it's got a reputation for producing big sumos like these boys, it's actually a really healthy meal. Lots of protein, lots of vegetables and relatively low in fat. I've got a nice selection of vegetables here, potatoes, some Japanese leeks or negi, daikon radish, carrots, Chinese cabbage, enoki mushrooms and shiitakes. Just use whatever comes to you. I don't even think they're saying real words back there. And I'll just parboil the carrots along with the potatoes. Once the root vegetables are parboiled, I put them aside so I can make the soup base. It's simply dashi stock, mixed with a light chicken stock, some soy sauce, sake, and mirin. It's always very important to taste the stock. That's not bad, just needs a touch of salt. Bring that to the boil now, and we can add in all of our ingredients. So it's time to get started with our meatballs. That's where this thing comes in. They just get flicked in using this little bamboo spoon and they'll form balls in the hot soup. Together with that, our pieces of chicken, our leeks, our enoki mushrooms, we can just break those into clumps. Our root vegetables can go in too. Shiitake mushrooms fried tofu and then cover the whole thing with the rest of our Chinese cabbage. Put the lid on there and we'll let it boil away. This is looking really good now. So the last thing we've got to do is to add the noodles. And now the big test. You may think that feeding this crowd is easy, but believe me, they know the difference between a good and bad chunko nabe. <laughs> Here we go. Doors up. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> It's just another Sunday night at the Takeuchi family home in suburban Osaka. <laughs> but Sundays are special because it's the only night of the week Masa Takeuchi gets to eat dinner with his family. You see, Masa owns and runs Sobakiri Masa, one of Osaka's finest soba noodle restaurants. He's there seven days a week, 365 days a year. And most of those days he's working for more than 15 hours at a stretch. Such are the demands on a chef who will settle for nothing less than perfection. Are you trying to make perfect soba? Uh, yes, trying. Trying. Do you think you can do it? No, I don't know. Until the end of my life. I don't know. But I think that's what I'm going to do. 
ことをやめなければ、うん、近づくことはできると思う Soba noodles are made from buckwheat flour mixed with a mid gluten plain wheat flour. Of course, Masa could buy the flour already milled, but he wants total control. So he buys the buckwheat he judges to be the best, then he makes the noodles exactly the way he wants them to be. The soba is the same as the soba. でもその難しいことはいらなくて、えー、当たり前のことをするっていうことがマサは今、ディッピングソースのソーバヌードルを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っているので、そういうものを作っている Well, this is really the wonderful thing about simple Japanese stocks like this. It's so clear and so light when you look at it, but it's, it's rich and deep and full of body. So, this is really interesting. This is a mix of soy sauce that Masa san is kind of his secret recipe soy sauce and various types of sugar, and also a particular kind of honey that he likes. And then his dipping sauce for his noodles is just. A mix of this one to four with that flavorful dashi. I think it's easy. It's a little bit of a s t Really interesting flavor. It's sweet and strongly umami. Umami is a little bit of a s t A little bit of a sour. It's a little bit of a sour. It's a little bit of a sour. First, it goes into this rapidly boiling water. Only for about 20 or 30 seconds, and it's kind of spidering out all over the place. And it's that separation between the noodles that allows them more to cook well through rather than being sort of pumped together.、It、goes into the first cooling bath, and that takes a lot of the temperature out of it, making sure that not one noodle is mixed rapidly washed in that cooling temperature bath, straight into ice water to bring the temperature right down. That's it. Handmade plate of zaru soba. This is this dipping sauce that Masa has made. Into that just goes a bit of chopped spring onion and some freshly ground wasabi. Years ago, during the Edo period, when soba became fashionable, the cool kids made a list a guide outlining the seven rules for eating soba. It included rules such as you must drink sake first. The noodles must be served chilled, and the diner must avoid conversation while eating. The sixth rule, however, is one I have a little bit of trouble with. It says, enjoy the sound of your soba when you're slurping it. And my mother will absolutely kill me, but unfortunately, in Japan, you've got to do it the right way, so sorry, Mum. The final rule states that I should dilute the dipping sauce with the boiled water that cooked the noodles to create a soup. Even though Masa says that his noodles aren't perfect, that's the perfect way to end a nearly perfect plate of soba noodles. There's one thing people in Japan love as much as food is baseball. I'm off to the home of Japanese baseball, Koshien Stadium in Osaka. A hot dog at a ballpark might be a US cultural icon, but in Japan they do things slightly differently. I'm catching up with an old mate, and with any luck, we'll see our beloved Hanshin Tigers claim early glory in the new season. But first, some fuel. Whether it's a hot dog in the baseball or a pie at the footy, I think a lot of us associate food and sport together. And here your options are pretty much endless. You've got sushi, you've got grilled meat, you've got the standard hot dog, and also some curry here as well. If you want to come here and eat, you can choose whatever you like. The array of stadium food for the Japanese sports fan is mind boggling, even down to a chilled cucumber on a stick. 
And whether you're in the finest restaurant or just cheering your team on to victory, it's quite clear that here in Japan, they never miss any opportunity to eat like a king. baseball fan and particularly a Tiger supporter. This is your Lords, your MCG, your Yankee Stadium. It really doesn't get any better than this. Well, actually, it does get even better. Beer on tap, delivered to your seat while you're watching the game. That is just spot on. Next time, I head south to Kyushu and Shikoku. It's bright and exciting and vibrant. It's anywhere in the world. I meet a bunch of grannies who've used iPads to save their town. It's quite incredible and quite special, really. A pig farmer who feeds his pigs strawberries. It actually changes the proportion of fat and meat. And explore a town they call Japan's Venice. Only about an hour from the tradition and culture of Kyoto is Osaka. Osaka is a city that's big and bold and larger than life and the food kind of mirrors the people here. This is a real city of the people. This time I get amongst Japan's finest cheap eats. I have to say takoyaki is one of my favourites. I hang out with a sumo legend. He's even got a couple of his own creations on the menu here so I've got to try them. I get a taste of baseball, Japan style. Beer on tap, delivered to your seat while you're watching the game. That is just spot on. And I experience perfect sober, the way it should be eaten. You gotta do it the right way, so I'm sorry, Mum. Since the very beginning, Osaka's been a place where money talks. In feudal times, while the samurai of Tokyo would go up and down stairs on the left, they say to give them more room to draw their swords, the merchants of Osaka always stuck to the right to keep their wallets safe from pickpockets. Even today, the greeting in the Osaka dialect, Mokarimaka, literally translates to, are you making lots of money? And today, that Osaka trait of watching the pennies means that this is the place to come for eating on the cheap. By now you could be forgiven for thinking that everything in Japan is just fine dining at the top end of town. But there's also this concept of BQ gurume or B grade gourmet. Cheap, casual eats that just taste good. But it's not necessarily low class. There's just as much care taken with these B grade foods as with the A grade. This is Dotonbori, a magnet for tourists. And in many countries that might mean a pretty average food experience but not here. The variety of Osaka's B-grade gourmet is brilliant. So let's start our cook's tour with the ever-popular takoyaki, octopus balls. I just love the speed and the pace of it. You can work up an appetite just by watching it being cooked. Lovely springy octopus in the middle. Soft kind of batter around it. Still a bit mushy. And then crispy on the outside with that really sweet, salty otofuku sauce. In here's one of the Osakan delicacies. Kushikatsu. This is what it's all about selection of skewers, all in a really light, crispy breading. This is pork, quail's eggs, ringy mushrooms, meatballs, even a crab claw in there. And they all go into this thick and sweet, salty sauce. As the sign says, no double dipping. There are more great dishes on Osaka's fast food menu. But for now, I'm done. Well, 
almost done. It's a terrible affliction never being able to pass up a dumpling. And the Japanese answer is, of course, a gyoza. Dipped in some vinegar, soy sauce, and some chili oil. Not bad at all. The surprises this city offers the food lover don't just end at the snacks. There's a quality of craftsmanship here that chefs and cooks come from all the world over just to get their hands on. I'm here to pick up something I've had on order for a while and I'm particularly excited because this is Sakai City and that's the home of Japanese knife making. This is Mizuno Tamrenjo, where the master bladesmiths of the Mizuno family have been making swords and knives for 150 years. They make knives for every style of cooking, from heavy cleavers for splitting bone, through to flexible blades for puffer fish. And the prices vary enormously. But there's one knife I really want to show you. It's a bit special. It's a fun of in my heart. This is the most expensive knife in the shop. And it's a sashimi bocho, specifically for sashimi. And something like this will set you back about $9,000. It's a little out of my price range. So I might just put that back before I drop it on my foot. And this one, the gyuto, has been made especially for me. Japan's most famous blade is, of course, the katana the legendary weapon carried by a samurai. The techniques for forging katana are still practiced when making kitchen knives. The repeated heating, beating and cooling of the steel creates a strong, durable blade that stays sharp. While we're here in Osaka, I thought I'd make one of my absolute favorite people's foods. So I'm making pork and shiso gyoza. Starting, of course, with the gyoza skin. I make the skins by mixing plain flour with hot water. The hot water activates the gluten, making the dough stronger. And you'll see why that's important in a minute. That dough is really nice and smooth now, so I'll just let that sit and relax for about half an hour. While that dough's resting, I've got here the ingredients for the filling of our gyoza. We'll start with the Chinese cabbage, and that needs to be finely shredded. And of course, I'm going to use this beautiful new knife that I have. To reduce its moisture content, the shredded cabbage is mixed with salt. And while that rests, I finally chop a bunch of spring onions. And in with the spring onions, some really fatty pork mince. And the fat's really important, because that's what's going to give us a nice, soft, and juicy texture to our filling. Just a few seasonings in that. Some soy sauce, sake, and mirin, the old favorites. And then some grated ginger as well. Our last ingredient into our pork and shiso gyoza. Shiso. These are a herb that have a really peppery, minty flavor. I'll just put those shredded shiso leaves straight in our dumpling filling. I always use a saucepan when I'm making dumpling fillings because it really does work well. The high sides keep the filling in the bowl. The handle is good to keep it steady. Our cabbage is looking good now. I'll just extract the last little bits of that moisture. That can go straight in to our pork mince. And the salt that's included in with all of that cabbage mix is going to make a real difference to the texture of our filling. Time now to prepare our skins. Simply cut into small cylinders, squash them flat, and then roll into discs. And the important part for a Japanese gyoza, as opposed to a Chinese jiaoza, is that the skin needs to be really thin so it can get nice and crispy. These are big jumbo gyoza, so we can afford to put a bit of extra filling in. But even though they're big, we're only using about a teaspoon to two teaspoons of filling per dumpling. And then just pinch one end and with a series of pleats, move along the entire length of the dumpling. And that's your gyoza. Now they've just started to brown, pour in some water. 
until it's about a centimetre up the side of the gyoza and then put the lid straight on. Turn the heat down just a touch and let that steam with the lid on for about 10 minutes or so. And now I just finish off the gyoza with a mixture of corn flour and water and add a little sesame oil. Just fold these out upside down, nice and crispy on the bottom. Normally you just serve these with a dipping sauce of some rice vinegar, soy sauce and chilli oil. But because we're in Osaka, I'm going to do something slightly different. This is Okonomiyaki style gyoza. And that begins with Otofuku sauce and Japanese mayonnaise. A really good amount of spring onions. And then finish off with our bonito flakes. There it is. Okonomiyaki style jumbo pork and shiso gyoza. Sumo wrestling is in more ways than one, the big time. Wrestlers go head to head in exhilarating battles of technique, speed and raw power. Every one of the six annual tournaments held around Japan has the electric atmosphere of a Las Vegas title fight. Sumos have their own language, customs and even cuisine. And they train for most of their lives for a shot at becoming champions. Those obtaining the highest rank of Yokozuna are bona fide superstars. Kimiyasu Chiba, who fought under the name Aratakayama, is a former wrestler who now runs Chanko Ryori Arata, a restaurant that specializes in sumo food. He was just nine when he left home to join the Fujishima stable, where he trained and learned the ways of the sumo. But at the age of 28, on the verge of reaching the top ranks, Aratakayama was forced to retire because of a life-threatening heart condition. その as part of his retirement ritual, Aratakama's coach cut off his sumo chonmage, his top knot. Aratakiyama thought his life was over, but really it had only just begun. He's a local hero around here, and despite being well down from his fighting weight, he still has an impressive appetite. Here at this restaurant, because it's one of Chiba-san's favourites, he's even got a couple of his own creations on the menu here, so I've got to try them. There's a few of my favourites here too, so he definitely will not be leaving hungry. This is Okonomiyaki, one of my real favorites and something I make at home all the time. It's a very similar process to the takoyaki, but the great thing with Okonomiyaki, the name is actually the things that you like grilled. Okonomiyaki is simple. Chopped cabbage and egg are stirred with a basic batter. Some tempura batter bits and pickled ginger are mixed in. And then you add whatever ingredients you like. It's fried into a thick pancake. And here at Noboridako, Hirokowada even adds a piece of pork belly on top. And then it's served with a sweet sauce, mayonnaise, spring onions or nori seaweed, and bonito flakes. The little takoyaki balls are pretty easy too. A watery batter is poured into this special hot plate Boiled octopus is added, along with some pickled ginger and more tempura batter bits. It's then flipped around until it cooks into a round ball, toasted on the outside but still soft in the middle. 
and these ones are served with Aratakiyama's own style of toppings that he and I have decided to call Tako Chanko. A bit of mayonnaise plus lemon, salt flakes, spring onions and sesame seeds. There's a lot to like about Osaka. The food's tasty, not too complicated. The people are great fun and always ready to have a laugh. It's a place you can really get used to. Thank you so much.